I will be really quick with my intro then. And I will be quick with mine as well. I can also stick sliders if I do. Don't don't worry about it. It'll be productive. For the sake of maybe That's fine. That's what we have to do. That's what we do. Oh, I, that's why you're so good at you, from experience I remember being surprised with how I could tell students you know like this will be on the exam and they still get that exam question wrong like half of them I'm like how? <laughs> it's like, okay here we go alright YouTube live stream guy we good to go? Max? are we good? okay so Good afternoon, good evening. Thank you everybody for coming. I'm really glad to see all these faces here. So um, my name is Jennifer Summers. I'm the uh, Program Development Specialist with the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife and we host this seminar series. So uh, this is the uh, CNR's uh, Spring Seminar Series and this year it is titled Landmark Environmental Policies, History, Impacts, and the Future. And so I would like to just say thank you to a few people who helped make this a possibility. So first of all, I'd like to thank um, our uh, previous director who has just recently retired, Scott Hingstrom. Uh, he helped to um, bring this series to fruition, helped identify some speakers and helped bring some of those speakers here. I'd also like to thank our current acting director, Dr. Shelley Dubay, who is take, was taken, taken over for the time being and has also helped me um, make this series a possibility. And now the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife is an extension organization. So everything that we do is, is based on trying to get uh, uh, natural resources knowledge and, and information out to the public and out and, and to our students as well. So I'd like to say thank you to those folks for um, making this possible and also of course the College of Natural Resources. So this is hosted for and by the College of Natural Resources um, and we uh, this is a, a collaborative effort. So thank you very much to them. So as I mentioned, this is a series. So this is the thir third talk in this series. It's a total of six talks. We have two more coming up. No, three more, sorry. And those dates are on the uh, on the screen behind me. So the next one is going to be March 6th. So not next week, but the week after. And we're going to have Gail Good, who is the Director of Air Management with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. And she's going to be talking about the Clean Air Act. So all of these, top, all of these talks focus on these major environmental policies that have had profound impacts on our natural resources and natural resources management. So if you care at all about the environment, this is a good, these are good talks to come to. The last two talks are going to be a little bit more about um, how these policies affect people on the ground, like how they affect actual practices of our um, of nonprofits and of our agencies. So um, be sure to check those out. And finally, um, we have this agreement with the uh, with with the tribes whose land our university sits upon. We recognize the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point occupies lands of the Ho Chunk and Menominee people. Please take a moment to acknowledge and honor the ancestral Ho Chunk and Menominee land and the sacred land of all Indigenous peoples. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Dubay, who is going to introduce our speaker. Yeah, I'm really excited. Thank you guys for being here. Um, it's really uh, extra special today because we have one of our longtime friends of the CNR um, to give a talk. And since we uh, announced that Dr. Mapes Martins was going to talk for our seminar series, students have come in and told Jennifer, oh, we just love his class. He's such a dynamic speaker. And we're like, oh. So now we've got like the bar is set really high. So wonderful. That's great. Um, he also wanted to be a marine biologist, I learned today. He is not. Um, no. Ter well, not terrible, but it means you're in the right place with some people that have, you know, some kindred spirits in here from your childhood. Um, I also wanted to share a couple of pictures that are a little more personal, you know, the headshot with the, you know, that, that's not what I think of when I think of Brad. I think of him outside with his family, enjoying the natural resources that we all enjoy as well. So um, he is the perfect speaker to talk today uh, about the Clean Water Act. So thank you so much. Thank you. See if I can get this to go on here. Is that working? Okay. All right. So my talk is entitled Wetlands and the Delineation of Federal Authority under the Clean Water Act. 
Now, some of you may be wondering why, with something titled about wetlands, do I have a photo of the Cuyahoga River burning? And it's because the Clean Water Act was initially designed to tackle a specific type of problem, right? And that was largely the type of pollution that was visible in the 1950s and 60s. So when, when they sat down to craft this legislation, this is what they had in mind, was rivers burning. They didn't have wetlands in mind. And so most of the issues that have arisen around the Clean Water Act have arisen in a context of trying to figure out what is the extent of the jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act. I'm not gonna spend the whole time talking about jurisdiction, largely because as a political scientist, I could talk for way too long about that and put everyone to sleep. Instead, I'm gonna start with a simple observation. February 28th, 2017, Donald Trump has been in office. He was inaugurated on January 20th, and he signs an executive order establish or repealing, I should say, the existing 2015 Waters of the United States designation. Now, the Waters of the United States is the legal category for which waters fall within the jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act. That in itself, not a terribly unique observation until we start to see that on January, I think it was 24th, it says 20th up there, but it wasn't signed until he got to it a couple days later. Uh, President Biden comes into office within days of being inaugurated. He signs a repeal of the Waters of the United States rule that was issued under the Trump administration. Now, as a political scientist, I love studying the Clean Water Act, I teach environmental law and regulation, but I will say this is bizarre to see two presidents within a month of taking office dealing with section 404 permitting jurisdiction is absolutely not something we typically see. Presidents generally don't deal with that level of detail in regulation. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is how did this happen? How did it come to be that the Clean Water Act passed in 1972 ends up making basically top priority for two presidents in the last seven years. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. But I'm gonna start with an observation. Uh, this is from Robin Kundis Craig, who is one of the leading scholars on the Clean Water Act and the Constitution. And I won't read you the entire thing. What I want mostly is to draw your attention to the second paragraph here, where Craig says that environmental constitutional jurisprudence may have progressed to the point where the very structure of the Constitution impedes necessary solutions to increasingly difficult environmental issues. That the Constitution structure, as interpreted by the court, court being the Supreme Court, may force an environmental law regime that does not and cannot accomplish goals deemed politically and scientifically desirable. Now, that particular quote probably could have been written in the last month. What's amazing is it was written in 2004, really before any of this becomes an issue. And that's because within the framework of the Constitution, the Clean Water Act, as with most environmental laws, hinges on a very, very sort of narrow basis, which is the Commerce Clause. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later, but for now I just wanted to start there to say that what we see from a very early vantage point is that the Clean Water Act is up against some very strict constitutional constraints. But let's get back to our story of how it is that the two presidents came to be super excited to sign repeals of the WOTUS rule. So this is just a little bit of an administrative history of the Waters of the United States rule, as well as on the right here, the sort of different areas that are covered under each of these different rules uh, with a couple of exceptions here. So the Clean Water Act right, starts in 1972. It is an update of the 1956 Federal Water Pollution Control Act. That in itself right, gets us started on the kind of broadening and nationalizing of water protection. 1977 though, Congress realizes that the way that it had been interpreted originally by the uh, 
EPA and the Army Corps engineer was that it was only going to apply to navigable waters. So they said, that's fine. We're going to step in. We're going to add an amendment. 1977, they add that amendment, clarifying that they would like it to cover adjacent waters or waters that are adjacent to navigable waters. Jump ahead a few years, right? It takes agencies a little bit of time to write these rules. And next thing we see, right, we have a Supreme Court case, Riverside Bayview, uh, that happens in 1985, which challenges the way that that 1977 amendment gets put into place. I don't want to necessarily go through each and every one of these. What I want to show with this timeline is that starting after 2006, we see kind of an increased pace of changes to the the Clean Water Act jurisdiction. And that largely comes about for a number of factors that are going to be the basis for this talk, right? One of those is the case Rapinos in 2006. So I'll talk about that in just a second. That introduced us to the bizarre term significant nexus, uh, which became, if any of you work on water issues, you know that it is entirely a legal fabrication. It is not a scientific term. Right? It is one of those things that you, you read and you go, what the heck did they mean by that? And you're going to find out exactly nobody knows what they meant by it. But it took them about nine years to kind of clarify it. Right? But notice, 2015, we get the Obama Clean Water Rule. 2017, we see Trump repeal that. 2019, there is uh, the formal repeal. And then right, we get a new rule issued under the Trump administration. A year later, the Biden administration comes in. They repeal that. The case makes it to, well, the Biden administration issues another rule. Uh, that's in December of 2022. And then in May of 2023, if you may have noticed last year, we had a case called Sackett versus EPA. Sackett versus EPA was effectively the uh, attempt by the Supreme Court to stabilize the Clean Water Act's jurisdiction. Right? Um, the problem is the way that it got stabilized really did restrict the ability of agencies to protect a lot of wetlands, right? So the, the thing that I want to draw your attention to here is that instability that kicks off right around 2006. So why does this regulation that is seemingly a relatively small part of the overall program of the Clean Water Act, why does this become unstable? And for that, we can look to the fine people on the 2006 Supreme Court, particularly this gentleman in the middle here, Anthony Kennedy. Now, this case was decided by a 4-1-4 court. That should sound a little strange because there's no majority, right? There's technically a majority in what's called a concurrence. Kennedy said, I'll agree with you for in judgment, but I think the reasons that you're doing it are all wrong. This led to absolute confusion, right? Courts aren't supposed to work that way. <coughs> They're supposed to say, hey, we all, five of us agree. Those four are wrong. We're going to tell them to shut up, right? And we get our way. Instead, what happened is Antonin Scalia, on the sort of right end of the, the spectrum up here, proposed that the jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act should be effectively restricted to continuous surface connection. That is, he thought that the jurisdiction, as it was defined by Congress, was very limited. His reasons for that, you may not agree with, but he thought, OK, if we read right, waters of the United States sort of in a very plain English way, it would imply to most people that that water needs to be present at all times. That was his interpretation. Um, it's one that is a common way of constructing interpretations in law. But he says, OK, I think that we're going to stick with this 1985, 1986 definition of waters that only have a surface connection. Now, for those who are studying wetlands, you can see why this might be a problem, right? particularly in the southwestern portion of the United States, where we have a lot of ephemeral water. Finding a surface connection can be very hard. And so large portions of the United States, in fact, in some of the places that may need the most amount of protection for the water that they have, are actually going to find that they are outside of the jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act if we go with the definition proposed by Antonin Scalia. However, along comes Anthony Kennedy. 
Anthony Kennedy for a long time was probably the single most powerful person in the United States insofar as he was the swing vote on the Supreme Court. And in this case, he said, listen, I think that the judgment is correct, but I think that we should actually use this test that was, he took it from a previous case. It was actually basically a footnote in that previous case. He said, what we're gonna look for is a significant nexus, right? And what he effectively meant by that is, if water from somewhere, right, in any way impacts the water quality of a navigable body of water, then that should count, right? That should be sufficient for saying that it is protected, right? So he wanted a slightly broader definition that would allow to say, we will protect more if it, it does seem to have an impact on the water quality at stake here. So one of the problems with this is it became a case-by-case -case basis, right? Every single determination about what was in the jurisdiction of the Army Corps engineers, whether they required you to get a permit, was going to have to be res basically resolved on a single case-by-case -case basis, which is incredibly time-consuming and not something that courts generally look favorably upon. So this is the basis for our problems, though, because a 414 decision, as you can imagine, doesn't lead to a clear outcome. Now, for those who, some of you are in my environmental law and regulation class, you will have to answer this question at some point, right? What do you do with a 414 opinion? Right? We know that five of them are kind of grouped together. So we know that four people we can ignore. Those are the four over here. But which of these two do we take as the controlling opinion? Right? Do we take the plurality, that is the four people, because four is bigger than one, or do we take the one because he's Anthony Kennedy? Right? And so this became a problem for courts. So this is the rulings of federal circuit courts of appeal to, figure, to show you that depending on which part of the country you're in, different courts were choosing different ones of these tests. Some of them were saying, right, if there's a little K here, uh, that you had to use the Kennedy test for a significant nexus. Some of them said, no, 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 you have to use the plurality test, which is where the P is, right? You'll see that some of those say you could use K or P. Uh, we have two areas, I believe, yeah, the sixth and the fifth, where all the cases that came up it didn't much matter which case because the wetlands would, would fall under jurisdiction either way, so we say no determination was needed. But this is not supposed to be how courts work, right? We're supposed to have a uniform application of law. That is, you shouldn't be able to shop around and go and have diff different jurisdictions determined in different parts of the country. So this triggers a very long, cumbersome process by which courts basically are waiting to figure out how do we resolve it. And I won't go through the about 12 different cases that occurred from 2006 to the present trying to deal with that. We'll jump eventually to the most recent one, which is here, right? So after Sackett, this is at least better than having six different jurisdictional interpretations. But what we see is, right, this is the attempt by the current, uh, current Army Corps engineers to define the waters of the United States in a way that is consistent with the Sackett case. So let me tell you a bit about this Sackett case, right? Sackett versus EPA was determined last May. And in it, right, the court looked back at Rapinos and said, we've been confused for effectively 20 years, right? We don't have a clear answer about what to do. So what did they do? They said, as you can imagine, we need to choose one of these tests, right? Either the test that Antonin, uh, that, uh, Antonin Scalia proposed, which would be the continuous surface connection that was originally used in the 1986 waters of the, Inter of the United States jurisdiction, or we need to choose the Anthony Kennedy test, which would be the significant nexus, which nobody was terribly thrilled about, um, or we can use the most recent one. The most recent one would have been, at that time, the one provided by the Biden administration which try to use, sort of walk a fine line between too expansive of a jurisdiction that would cover waters that the court was definitely not gonna allow and covering right, only navigable waters. They would like to see right, the current, or the one that was proposed, I think it was originally proposed in December of 2022, their goal was definitely cover navigable waters. 
right? Try to cover every water that is adjacent to those. And then they added another step to that, which is they would like to have some ephemeral waters included. Again, the criteria for when to do that, very much determined by, hopefully, the science, right? When is it that water quality is actually affected by the surrounding area? So this is where we got to. Now, up to this point, I don't think there's much that I'm adding as a political scientist here, right? I mean, a simple regulatory review. What I want to explain is how is it, right, when we see these presidents signing something four weeks or four days after they've been inaugurated, how did this issue come to be elevated to that level of importance, right? And we see it's definitely unstable, right? Which in legal terms, not a good thing, right? We see lots of change going on, right? Eight different revisions over the course of about five years, if you count the repeals as well, right? And we see that even at the end of this, this is as close to stable as we've gotten. And so what I want to talk about here is kind of a quick comparison, since the title of our series was about both the impact, but also the history and the future of these regulations, I want to run a little comparison for you, right? And that is, what would stabilize this, this particular water of the United States jurisdiction, right? What stabilizes it in such a way that might allow us to talk about covering wetlands more thoroughly again? Because right now, things don't look very good, right? The current Sackett decision has dramatically restricted the scope of what can be considered a wetland for legal purposes, and that has definitely hindered the ability of agencies to issue rules that protect those, right? So let me see if I can perhaps tell a little bit of the history here, right? Which is environmental law comes about at an incredibly unique moment in time. All of the major laws that we look at, Endangered Species Act, right? Uh, Wilderness Act, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act amendments, right? Those are all basically products of this very brief window of time right here in the 70s, right? With a peak in the late 70s, about 10 years after the EPA has come into existence. We see another peak in the late 1980s, right? This happens to be, right, I mean, 1990 is the last time that the Clean Air Act is amended uh, substantially by Congress, right? The last time the Clean Water Act was fully amended was 1977, right? Law is supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be boring. You're supposed to talk about things from five decades ago, not from changes four weeks ago, right? It's not supposed to be something that changes that much. So this is something that came about at a very particular point in time and that time is very different than what we live in now. And so I want to kind of draw that contrast to talk about how it is that politics today have moved the issue of water front and center, largely around whether or not you can restrict people's use of their private property. Okay, this one's gonna take a second to, ex second to explain. So let me, uh, let me give you a sense of what you're looking at. It is color-coded by a party because I'm a political scientist and that is how everything must be. Uh, so blue is for Democrats, red is for Republicans. It's down here in case you forget, right? The bottom part of this represents, so the x-axis is a timeline always in two-year increments because we study sessions of Congress, so we do all our time series that way, right? The top up here represents the Senate. Along that same axis, we're going from 18, right around the Civil War to the present. And right here in the middle, this tinier little line here that are a little bit thicker, that's presidential terms. So each unit represents a two-year window of time with the presidents obviously operating on, six, uh, on four years. And you may be wondering why is the Senate in two-year terms? It's because a third of the Senate gets elected every two years, so it does change. Now, as a political scientist, this tells me a ton about the particular circumstances of when something is created. So if you look at these lines, right, everything starts at 50% because that's what you need to control either the House or the Senate, right? So you need 50% majority. But it tells me how big that majority is, right? And you can note, right, back after the Civil War, you see Republicans have incredibly large majorities in both the House and the Senate. 
You'll also notice here, right around 1933, we see a pretty big shift in the pattern of how those colors look. Right? This is what political scientists call partisan realignment. Right? You see a dramatic shift in how people start to vote. In this case, you can blame uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Right? And the New Deal, he turned out to be a pretty popular person. He gets four of those little blocks in a row right there. Right? But the New Deal changed how people voted. Now, what's important for our purposes is thinking about this window of time right here from about 1960 to about 1990. 1960 to 1990, give or take, is a period where Democrats have really stable majorities. Now, I'm going to use that term. We'll come back to talk about it a little bit more later. But what I mean by that is, if you are a Republican and you are running for office in the 1960s, 1970s, the odds of you winning are pretty slim, right? We see that Republicans don't really, right? I mean, if you're talking about the, the late 60s under right, the Johnson administration, you're facing 65, 70% vote on the part of Democrats. You as a Republican have really very little say in anything, right? That is actually relatively good for democracy. Turns out, if we look at this period over here, which we'll talk about a little bit more, notice those numbers get much smaller. Those majorities change dramatically. They're a lot closer to 50%. That's not good for democracy. If what we want is people to compromise, we need them to think that they have no chance of winning. That may sound strange. Turns out that's how it is. Right? This is based on the work of Francis Lee out of Washington University. It's a book called Unstable Majorities. But the idea is, right, when you have a stable majority, the only way to get anything done, if you're a Republican, is to find a Democrat who's willing to basically trade votes with you. Right? You want the Clean Water Act? No problem. I'll vote for the Clean Water Act if you vote for something I want. Right? It's called horse trading. People will engage in it if they think they might win, right? Or if they think that they might get something out of it. The problem is, when we get over here to these smaller majorities, why would I ever compromise if I think in two years I can get everything that I want? Right? I mean, think about how this looks. The first two years of the Trump administration, the first two years of uh, the Obama administration, the first two years of the Biden administration, they all have unified government. That is, they have a House and a Senate that's of the same party as the president, which gives the president a lot more power. Right? Presumably, it gives the president the opportunity to work with members of their own party to do things that they think are important. When we see those colors change, right, when we see that there's blue with a little bit of red there, that, not so good. Right? That's called divided government. And there once was a time where divided government wasn't such a big deal. Today, divided government effectively means nothing gets done by Congress. If you've grown up since really 1995, you're pretty much just used to a Congress that doesn't do anything. Uh, right? Certainly not on the environment. It doesn't pass any major legislation. But let me come back to this 1970s period, because that is when the Clean Water Act is passed and amended. Now. There's one more part to this, right, which is we see that the majorities are large during that time for Democrats. And somewhere around 1995, if you've heard of the uh, you know, contract with, with America and Newt Gingrich, it was because of the effect he had in 1995 on that election, which shifted it back to effectively a competitive system right, with close results. But the next thing that I want to talk about, besides just how unique that period of, of legislation is, is this. So this is the uh, Martin Quinn scores for m members of the Supreme Court going back to the 1930s. So these laws, particularly the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, right, as these major pieces of environmental legislation are passed and amended in the 1970s, they make their way into courts in the 1980s. Now, what I want you to take note of is this yellow line here represents 
the uh, median justice. So if you take all nine of them and you measure their ideology using this Martin Quinn scoring system, the median right, is represented by the bold yellow line. Down here, this guy, William Douglas, you can thank him for a lot of environmental legislation. Uh, he's, he is effectively as liberal as you can get and still be on the Supreme Court. Um, but notice, he didn't start that way, right? So having zero right there in the middle, I'm trying to keep it stable, but that zero line tells us right, that someone, if, they were, if that's the median, if it sits at zero, then we know that right, they have effectively no ideological leanings. What we can tell, though, is in the 1980s, whenever these cases start to get to the Supreme Court, it's in this brief window of time where the Supreme Court is actually relatively liberal. Now, if you take this line and go further back, that is the high watermark of liberal Supreme Courts right there, by a lot. Um, in the, certainly in the 1870s, wasn't the most liberal. And prior to Civil War, forget about it. <laughs> but it, the idea here is to put into context this more conservative court that we've seen in the past 20 years is something of a regression to the mean, right? It is not necessarily that the court is uniquely conservative now. It's actually not even the most conservative it's ever been. But it's just conservative relative to what we got used to whenever these laws were being challenged. That matters for us because now when these same laws are being challenged and when the, right, the definition of the waters of the United States get challenged, the court doesn't read it the same way. So the first case that, we, that I mentioned was Riverside Bayview. That was decided in 1985, right? The court at that point is almost a full unit uh, conservative, right? So then we get this little brief dip here. And this, this is our, our kind of like golden years. That happens to coincide with Bill Clinton and his usage of executive orders to expand environmental protection. You can thank his vice president for a lot of that, a guy named Al Gore, who was the first and right, only person to ever run for office as an environmentalist, uh, right, attained vice president. Pretty impressive. So this sort of moment that we live in with a more conservative court is really, right, coming, that's, that was our liberal court right there. Um, that was our other liberal court, right? Those are the moments where we start to see that right, the way that the waters of the United States is going to be interpreted is probably going to shift from how it's been interpreted in the past. So the last point, uh, and this is my nod to trying to kind of talk about this in very democratic terms, which is we oftentimes think of environmental legislation in response to the social movement of environmentalism right around Earth Day. And so this is a proxy for that. We don't have great data about who actually participated, participated in Earth Day. It wasn't necessarily very well tracked. So the closest we have is the most important problem question, which is asked by Gallup every year, usually in late March. Right, and it goes back to the 1940s, um, with good data anyways. And so this is the percent of respondents who list the environmental issues, broadly speaking, not just water, but any environmental issue as being the most important facing the country. We see, not surprisingly, like right around Earth Day, we see a very large spike. And somewhat surprisingly, we see this very large spike in the early 1990s, largely around the first sort of uh, conference about climate change, right, largely around the revisions to the Clean Air Act and other issues that were going on at that time. But uh, the anti-nuclear movement had a lot to do with getting support for that. But then notice, right, it has since kind of stabilized, dropped off, however you want to put it. Uh, not that many people list the environment as their most important problem. The reason I bring that up is when we think about the future of the waters of the United States, we can't look to what people in the 1970s and 80s and 90s look to. Right? We can't think about, will the Supreme Court save it? No, they won't. They've already demonstrated that. Right? Will executive orders be sufficient? Well, it looks like 
at least from this instability, that every time someone gets in and broadens the definition of the waters of the United States, someone comes right behind them and repeals it, right? And passes a new one. That itself, not terribly good, right? And will we see a broad public outcry for a push for expanding coverage for wetlands? I wouldn't count on that either, right? Not if this data tells us a lot about how people are motivated to sort of contact public officials and whatnot. So with this as our sort of baseline, let's talk about how it's changed over time. All right, so this goes back to uh, the 92nd Congress, which would have been 1971-72. And this is based on what's called a DW nominate score, which again measures in two dimensions the ideology of members of Congress, with the House on the right and the Senate on the left. And again, we have this zero line in the middle. So if that line, right, if we saw each of these parties' measurements of their average member at zero, then their average member has no real affiliate, sort of ideological affiliation. One thing we can see since 1972 is Democrats have become very, very, very marginally more liberal in the Senate. In the House, they've become a little bit more liberal. And Republicans have become more conservative. There's a lot of reasons for that. The most recent political realignment of the 1970s involved Southern Democrats switching parties and becoming Southern Republicans, which is generally how we think of the South now. Right? When that block of voters switched, not surprising that people who were Republicans would appear more conservative and Democrats would appear less liberal because they lost a key group of what would have at one time been a very strange thing, a conservative Democrat. But the important part for our story is this, this distance right here between the two. This is what we mean when we say that Congress has become more polarized, that is, the average person who's a Republican in Congress and the average person who's a Democrat in Congress are pretty far apart. And they've gotten much further apart. Uh, I didn't include the historical reference because I figured you probably weren't that interested in how ideologically polarized Congress was in the 1800s. But for a point of reference, we're slightly more polarized than we were in the 1860s, which was during a civil war. So that should be at least somewhat telling. Now, this brings me to kind of the last part of this. What might be, right, what might be going on besides just polarization? Because polarization is crucial. We don't see Congress coming together to resolve issues, right? And we, in fact, what we do see is Congress basically sleeping on the job. They're not passing a lot of legislation, right? I mean, if you've Watch the news in the last two weeks, you can see Congress fail to pass legislation. It's not that hard anymore. But we see this tapering of environmental laws since the 1990s, but we see during the 1990s an increase in the use of executive orders dealing with the environment. And that is a big part of what causes the politicization, the increasing attention to issues around specifically water. Right? Now, the WOTUS definition, right, the reason it's at the forefront of political battles is because it's one of those areas that most directly comes into conflict with the use of private property. I'll talk a bit about more of that in just one second on the next slide. I think it's the next slide. But what I want you to notice here, right, is simply this shift. And this is the shift that explains a lot of what we see with environmental issues, but especially with the Clean Water Act. And that is a shift that as Congress stops passing law, that doesn't mean we stop doing things about the environment. It just means that all the, the efforts to do things about the environment come from the less representative branches of government, either the courts or the executive branch and the president. Right? This is not necessarily how things are supposed to work. Congress is supposed to pass a law, Right? I mean, we all, if you've seen your, your schoolhouse rock, right? Like Congress passes the law, the executive branch implements the law, and the court interprets the law, and we're all happy when that works that way. Um, in this case, though, what we see, and this is based on, on research by uh, 
Christopher Klaza and I forget Sousa's first name, but right, this is research that they've done to show that as we see the, the particularly on environmental issues, as we see a decrease in congressional efforts at passing laws, or actually successes at passing laws, then what we see is presidents who pick up the ball and start going, right? They pass executive orders. Or courts who feel compelled to step in. It just so happens to be that during this time period, presidents, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, Joe Biden, who are Democrats, have a lot of pressure because they represent generally environmentalists. And so they use those, and that helps kind of push things along. But one thing, right, just a quick note, uh, at least in political science, right, like if I want to know how important something is to somebody, I usually want to know what their budget is. Um, and we see that the budget is actually a relatively stable thing when we adjust it for inflation, right? The budget for, uh, in the US, for all those things that are coded by the Office of Management Budget as either natural resource or science, they don't have an environmental designation. So uh, these are the designations that are used in the US budget for determining, right, what category the spending is. But what we see is like what we might expect. There's not much federal spending prior to the 1960s because there's not really any federal laws that require it. By the time we get right, new legislation in the 1970s, you need money to create an EPA, you need money to, in, to implement these laws. So the budget goes up and it stays up and it kind of slowly you know, increases. We can see the recession in 2009, uh, which is when we had lots of shovel-ready projects that the government was paying for. I don't want to dwell too much on this one, just to show that as a, as a matter of priority, right, it's not that, that science and natural resources aren't crucial. It's just that they've been pushed to the forefront. Now, I come back to this because this is the last point here. right? And I've sort of already made it, but I want to reiterate it again. The last factor that has made this much more political and is closely related to polarization is that we have unstable majorities. We live in a period of very close elections. And that makes people very unwilling to compromise. Right? I mean, think about the legislation that's going on in Congress right now. Why, if you think you're going to win in November, would you compromise on anything right now? Right? I mean, if you think you have a chance, a coin flip's chance of winning, that is very likely to shape what you think you can get out of a compromise. So in that sense, this, this period that's been going on since 1995 of closer and closer elections. I mean, what, the, the last presidential election, if you change, what, about 60,000 votes in Michigan and Wisconsin, right? 60,000 votes in a country of 340 million people with an electorate of about 175 million people. 60,000 votes. You get a different outcome to, the, to your election, right? That is a tremendous, tremendously small margin for parties to win on. And so when we say that these, these majorities are very unstable, this is what we mean. Now, the last part. The court is kind of not the same as it was in the 70s anymore either, as you may have imagined. Um, this is our current makeup of the court. And the two things that have changed about the way the court interprets the Clean Water Act, particularly the waters of the United States, jurisdictional provisions is, one, we've seen that the way that the court defined its interpretation of the Commerce Clause very broadly in 1942 in response to a lot of New Deal efforts and a little bit of uh, arm twisting by FDR. But the way that the court interpreted that in Wickard v. Filburn kind of reached its high watermark in 1995 with U.S. versus Lopez. Since then, the court has been less and less willing to grant Congress authority just because Congress says what it's doing is regulating interstate commerce. Now, that not so much important to what we're talking about today. This side is what's important to what we're talking about today, which is the court has also been willing, or unwilling, I should say, to defer to agencies. Now, what that means is typically, right, agencies will issue a rule, right, and that rule has to come out of something in the law that they think needs clarifying such as, hey, what does significant nexus mean whenever we're talking about waters United States? Right? The Army Corps engineer sits down nine years later. They come up with a rule that they hope has kind of accomplished that goal. And immediately, right, like the second that rule gets published, it's going to court. There is someone who is going to challenge it. 
There are too many institutions whose job it is to make sure it gets challenged. Right? That's true both environmental groups will challenge it for not doing enough, and conservative groups will typically challenge it for doing too much. Right? And those conservative groups tend to be based on issues around private property use. Um, the key case in this case is, not surprisingly, from 1984, right around that same time that the rule was being issued that we talked about earlier, and that is the Chevron case, which you may have heard in the news in the last month, because on January 17th, uh, Loper Bright Enterprises versus Raimondo and Relentless versus Department of Commerce were heard by the Supreme Court, where the court is now in the midst of, sometime in probably May or June, we'll find out, trying to figure out how much it's going to allow agencies to interpret these rules. But the key here is that the court has stopped being willing to let agencies define the jurisdiction of the waters of the United States. So we can't expect to have that be the savior for trying to protect wetlands. So if it's not going to be the executive, because that's too unstable and the next executive changes it, and it's not going to be the court, what's left? Well, we have one last effort. This is sort of the textbook play for trying to protect wetlands. It's what you might expect if you were going to just write one of those jailhouse rock songs about how to protect wetlands, which would be you just pass a law. I know in this whole story it seems strange, right? We said, oh, in 1977 they amended the Clean Water Act. Nothing stopped Congress from fixing it again. They could just redefine the jurisdiction of wetlands to say, this includes adjacent wetlands, and it does not require a continuous surface connection. Right? They could broaden it by legislation. Crazy idea. Turns out someone had that idea back in October, after they saw that the Supreme Court pretty much removed those protections. And so uh, it was a list of like 120 people that sponsored it. I didn't include the list. but. As you can imagine, right, it didn't pass because, well, that's 2022's House of Representatives minus, of course, the most recent uh, New York election. But right, Democrats are in the minority and they're pr proposing it. But what this means, though, is people are starting to think again about how do we protect wetlands using the most stable mechanism that's available, using the one that isn't cut off to us all the time, which is laws, right? We don't want to rely on a president and hope that the next president doesn't restrict wetlands. We don't want to rely on a court that doesn't interpret in favor of agencies anymore. So the next best thing is just tell them what to do. Pass a law. Hopefully, that's what we'll get out of the next administration. So I'll wrap up there. Do you have any questions? Please. So, in the current legislative climate, um, 5983 that you showed did not pass, right? Nope. Um, and you made a really good point about the ability to compromise being more challenging when there are really slim um, majorities. Is this issue one where a like bipartisan or some other flavor of compromise could be what turns the tide on getting something done? So the question is, given, given the legislative effort right. and given the slim majorities, might bipartisanship be the, the, the kind of yeah, there, way to get through with know, this? Is there a compromise definition, right, of like what regulatable <sighs> waters mean that would please multiple parties? OK, so I'm going to answer this in a legal way okay. Okay. that may not have any scientific validity whatsoever, um, right, which is theoretically there's a compromise, um, right? It, I would actually probably, you know, if pushed, I would argue that the 2015 rule was a bit expansive. But really, like, when we think about 
protecting wetlands, like the compromise is really a clearer version of what Anthony Kennedy said, which is the goal of the Clean Water Act is to protect the chemical, biological, and physical integrity of our nation's waters. If something's having an impact on it, whether it's continuously connected or not, shouldn't matter. The reason that the courts have been so resistant to that idea was that they don't want to interpret the Commerce Clause as applying to any water that's underground, right? Anything that's not navigable. And that just goes back to court case from 1828, right? Um, in terms of it being a bipartisan effort, oh, that would be wonderful. I would love to see that. It's not impossible. Um, I just think it's very unlikely. Republicans have not necessarily picked up the issue of water, uh, certainly not in, in favor of expanding wetlands. Um, they tend to be, at least as they've argued it in court, right, they, they tend to be very preferential for elevating private property rights over the authority of agencies to protect wetlands. So with that in mind, I would think it's probably going to be Democrats. And if, if our pattern of recent elections holds, that means you have basically a two-year window after a president gets elected if they have their same party controlling the House and the Senate, which means it's got to be an important issue, but it looks like it's becoming an important issue. We have two presidents in a row who've come into office, and that's the first thing they do, or it's one of the first things they do. So hopefully it's gaining some traction. The question is, can it gain traction in Congress amongst Democrats? Um, hopefully. Uh, contact your local you know, Democratic elected officials and see if you can raise that issue. But I wouldn't expect it to be a bipartisan solution, largely just because we're seeing less and less. Uh, there's recently, right, we're not even seeing just less and less legislation that's bipartisan. We're seeing less and less actual communication between members of different parties in Congress. Like they literally, physically do not cross the aisle to talk to other people as much as they used to. Daniel? I guess I'm a little confused because you showed in terms of where environmental issues are in terms of public importance, it's like 1 to 2 percent. Yeah. People list it as like the most important issue. So it's not really that important. Yet presidents are addressing these things a few days after being in office. That seems a little contradictory. Is there, from a political science perspective, is there something there that we can leverage to try to make Congress? look at water as an important issue, something that they should be considering as a positive? So I will first address the, so the question was, given what we saw about public opinion, which seems like it's a relatively low number of, or a low level of importance as an issue, but given that we see presidents signing it pretty early, which seems like it is pretty important, are those two, like what's the relationship between those two? Um, Okay, so I'm gonna speak as a, a, an optimistic political scientist for a second. The optimistic political scientist would say, please contact your local, you know, your, your elected officials because public input matters. Okay, now I'm gonna speak as a, an actual political scientist and say that the work of James Druckmann on when presidents actually do anything that aligns with public opinion is virtually zero. Um, only if they already know that the public agrees with what they want to do, will they cite public opinion. Um, so there's a lot of evidence that public opinion isn't really all that relevant. What does make things relevant, though, isn't public opinion. It's losing, right? If you can threaten someone, that is, if the public could at least make a viable threat, a credible threat, that this issue is important enough, water protection is important enough, that they would vote for someone else or not vote at all, um, then I guess you could expect lots of movement from members of Congress. That being said, uh, it's hard to get people to, to make that level of effort. So I'm not saying that that's necessarily the best route, but you know, you can also hope that some people are, are working on it. And they may be doing it for purely partisan reasons, but that may be OK, too. Uh, so there, there's not, like, I don't have a great answer in terms of, like, I, I'm, I'm always very torn about this. How much do we say, like, yes, lots of public input will solve the problem? Again, the optimist in me says, I hope it happens. Um, but the more evidence-based person in me says, that's not very likely. Um, 
So you have, it has to be a threat. It can't just be lots of people. We see this all the time, right? Lots of people in public opinion polls say things, but they aren't willing to vote on them. So until people are making this an issue that they'll vote on, nice thing is in close elections, you don't need that many people to make a threat that they won't vote for you on a particular issue to get their attention. So that would be my, my long-winded response. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know. Okay, so let me rephrase or restate the question, see if I'm getting it right. So you're asking basically, like, given that it seems like this is done through executive orders and that that's not necessarily the most representative way to, to kind of capture the public's voice, how might people kind of increase, increase their impact on it? Um, under current conditions, that is what we just looked at, I would say focus on state issues, right? I mean, that's not a great solution long term, right? I mean, water quality is going to vary a lot by state if you have some states where people care a great deal. Um, in many ways, this is what the Supreme Court wanted, right? It returns us basically back to the 1950s when that was how water was largely regulated was at the state level. Um, again, it means that you can get really uneven. Some states will have much worse water protections than others. But it means that there is much more likely to be where your voice will, will actually be heard is at the state level. And certainly for people in this particular college who are likely to go work at agencies, uh, you're kind of a crucial group of people who can bring not only your voice as a citizen, but also your expertise to that topic. And hopefully some knowledge of kind of what are some of the things that are holding it up? What are the bigger forces at work that, that may be frustrating you? Okay, so the question is, what do we need to do to get students to perceive the role of politics in their likely careers? Um, whew, that's a really good question. I mean, as an educator, right, like my hope is that we do this, that we, we try to raise awareness about that issue and try to educate students about it. Um, at least one thing that I try is to point to how much those changes are going to impact their day-to-day -day lives. Right? I mean, if you've worked at the Army Corps Engineers in the last, or I think there's at least one former CNR student I am aware of who is, I believe, the federal regulatory specialist for the uh, US Geological Survey, your job is going to change dramatically basically every two years. You're going to spend two years working on right, trying to implement rules that are very much up for changes. right? basically when a new administration comes in. Now, if that's your career, right? If, if you started in 2006 around Rapinos, oh my goodness, like how burned out are you on trying to deal with dozens of changes on a pretty much yearly basis? But as a student, you won't know that, right? You'll only know that after you've been kind of out there working for 20 years and you lost all your hair, pulled it all out, and you're frustrated. So I guess in some ways, like speaking of, two people who've undergone those changes or seen how those changes can be really frustrating might help students understand that as much as we may not like it, none of us are immune to politics, right? It, it shapes especially the way that, that we deal with natural resources in the United States. So, so that's, what we, that's what we would do. That's what, thank you.